Hey, good evening. Uh, this is Dr. David Knox of the CAN-MDs, and uh, going to talk a little bit uh, tonight about uh, pregnancy and uh, cannabis. Um, actually, more importantly, it, it has to do with the endocannabinoid system and uh, pregnancy. Um, did a little uh, research and uh, some uh, recent information is uh, coming out that uh, the uh, uh, endocannabinoid system uh, plays a big role in pregnancy. Um, all of the receptors, uh, the ligands, including anandamide and 2-AG, uh, all the synthesizing and degrading uh, enzymes, transportation molecules, you know, everything involved with the whole system is uh, present from the very earliest stages of pregnancy. And uh, uh, throughout the uh, pre and postnatal stages of development, uh, the uh, endocannabinoid uh, system plays an essential role. Uh, there were essentially three specific areas that uh, it seems to have the biggest uh, role. Uh, number one, uh, initially there are very high levels of anandamide and uh, cannabinoid receptors in the uh, pre-implantation uh, embryo as well as the uterus. And uh, uh, studies seem to show that uh, successful passage of the embryo down the uh, oviduct uh, and into the uterus as well as implantation of the embryo in the uterus depends on critical control of the optimal levels of anandamide. Um, and uh, this varies by time and site. So uh, specifically uh, for implantation in the uterus to occur, uh, there has to be a very significant drop in anandamide levels uh, within the uterus uh, for the uh, embryo to attach. Um, they've uh, done some studies that show uh, uh, if you have a uh, very uh, uh, low level of the uh, uh, FAAH, which is the anandamide uh, breakdown uh, enzyme, uh, that results in high levels of anandamide and uh, much more risk of having a miscarriage. So uh, that's uh, one area that is uh, critical in pregnancy. Uh, second area where uh, the uh, endocannabinoid system is involved is in uh, neurodevelopment. Um, uh, they've done studies that show that uh, CB1 receptors are very transiently uh, uh, with growth present in uh, various white matter areas of the brain. And uh, this suggests a uh, you know, very strong role of the endocannabinoids in brain development. Uh, all the areas of regulating nerve cell differentiation into the different types of neurons. It uh, guides axonal development and uh, generates all the synapses or connections uh, between the cells in the brain. Uh, so that's uh, very dependent on uh, uh, normal endocannabinoid functioning. Another uh, third area that uh, has been shown to be of significance is uh, after delivery. Uh, postnatally, uh, the CB1 receptors have a big role in uh, development of uh, milk suckling. Uh, this is mostly based on mouse studies. Um, the endocannabinoids, uh, particularly anandamide, are found in mother's milk, and uh, activation of the CB uh, receptors uh, seems to be critical for activating normal uh, uh, oral uh, motor function for suckling. Uh, so the research is really kind of uh, interesting uh, how much uh, the endocannabinoid system is involved uh, from the, the get-go uh, in all of us mammals. So um, just wanted to look a little more into uh, the use of uh, the cannabinoids uh, during pregnancy. And uh, uh, just as an aside, you know, there are a little historical uh, uh, evidence that uh, use goes back as far as the 7th century BC. Uh, they've uh, uh, been using it for a long time. Uh, as you can expect, uh, going back since forever, you know, pregnancy has had its associated problems, uh, especially uh, nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, morning sickness, you can call it. Um, statistics uh, indicate that perhaps even up to 
70 to 80 percent of pregnant women uh, suffer some degree of nausea and vomiting, and a small percentage, perhaps one or two percent, uh, uh, experience uh, hyperemesis. Uh, uh, that's our, our frequent visitors to the emergency room when they're in the early pregnancy, hyperemesis gravidarum, where they just cannot stop vomiting. Uh, you know, in extremes, you just have severe uncontrolled vomiting resulting in man malnutrition and uh, weight loss, which, uh, of course, is the last thing you want to happen during pregnancy. Uh, so historically, cannabis has certainly been used for that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ethan Russo even uh, uh, authored a, uh, a book uh, called Cannabis Treatments in Obstetrics and Gynecology, A Historical Review. And uh, yeah, I made uh, several notes in there that uh, uh, flowers and herbs of the uh, uh, of the cannabis, uh, seeds of the cannabis were used in Chinese and Persian societies um, also to help induce contractions, prevent miscarriages, and also help control postpartum hemorrhages. In our own society in uh, recent centuries, uh, you know, cannabis tinctures were uh, very popular to control nausea and uh, as well as to uh, help hasten delivery. Um, a lot of other uh, anecdotal uh, information, you know, historically used to control pain um, and uh, other complications. Uh, and this comes from African, Indian, and Southeast Asian uh, cultures as well. So, uh, long history of cannabis use in, uh, in pregnancy and uh, um, you know, not too much notation as far as, uh, you know, problems or complications. But the uh, uh, question now becomes, you know, how does this really relate to our current day use uh, of uh, cannabis and, and uh, as well as our understanding of, of how it all works together? So I uh, did a little research, and uh, when you uh, look over all the current publications, uh, as expected, there's really an overriding concern that our increasing acceptance of use of cannabis is going to have a significant deleterious effect on our children. Uh, most of the worry is that uh, with our current mindset, you know, people are feeling the use of cannabis is harmless and we just are not even realizing the real risks that we are uh, giving our children. Um, so starting with the American Congress of Obstetrics and uh, Gynecology, they strongly recommend that cannabis use be stopped before and during pregnancy. Uh, they uh, support their position uh, based on uh, possible evidence that cannabis consumption in pregnancy might be associated uh, with restrictions in growth of the fetus, perhaps some increased miscarriage risk, and uh, uh, long term, you know, they uh, think there may be cognitive and other uh, neurologic uh, defects in the, uh, in the uh, infants. Um, and uh, uh, overall, right now, uh, statistics show that perhaps 2 to 5 percent of women uh, use cannabis during their pregnancy. And uh, when you look at some uh, subgroups in the population, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged young and urban uh, women, uh, perhaps up to 28 percent of them uh, are uh, using cannabis during pregnancy. Uh, so I tried to uh, do a little more research, you know, explore some of the, uh, the risks, you know, how risky is it, and uh, really find out what I could about some of these uh, studies that uh, have been done that uh, uh, a lot of the literature kind of refers to. Now we do know that uh, you know, basic physiology, THC does cross the placenta and uh, uh, they've uh, done some studies that show with an acute use of uh, cannabis, the uh, uh, fetal plasma levels may be approximately 10 percent of uh, uh, maternal levels. Uh, but uh, as is usual with cannabis, since it's stored in fatty tissues over time, you can have higher concentrations uh, in the fetus. 
so referring back to what we know about the endocannabinoid system and uh, how it uh, plays a big role in fetal development, uh, you just have to concede there may be some reason to be concerned about the effects of exogenous cannabinoids on uh, this system. Um, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there are a lot of limitations uh, to the data that uh, are uh, shown in these studies. Uh, a lot of it is kind of ambivalent, uh, but uh, you know, overall the publications say, you know, there seems to be a trend and uh, we should be worried about it. So um, just wanted to expound on uh, those concerns here a little bit more. When you go back to uh, reefer madness, uh, uh, there's a lot of concern, uh, a lot of uh, information was put out, oh, that cannabis causes birth defects. It causes genetic uh, uh, malformations and, uh, uh, you know, you're damaging your children. And, uh, um, you know, it's uh, uh, a lot of hype uh, for the most part. Um, there really have been no studies that show any clear cause of a cannabis causing definitive anatomic defects, um, nor any real increase in uh, mortality, although even the uh, uh, Congress of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology said there may be a slight risk of increased miscarriage. Um, and uh, had one study that uh, explored 20 different uh, uh, types of birth defects or major anomalies, and uh, this showed no difference between users and non-users as far as rate of occurrence. However, they did say that there was uh, one study that did a little more refined analysis, and uh, they found that if uh, they studied only uh, use of cannabis during the very first month of pregnancy, uh, there was a sim, uh, some increase in the odds of anencephaly. That's where there's no development of the brain. Um, you know, this is an extremely rare event, and uh, one criticism of that study is that there was no control, the fact that these were low socioeconomic uh, patients, and uh, they also failed to take supplements like folic acid, uh, which clearly has been shown to have a big role in neurodevelopment as well. So uh, still a big question of whether there's, there's uh, a significant association or not there. Um, quoting uh, another uh, uh, non-definitive studies, there's some uh, evidence that prenatal exposure can be associated with uh, subsequent defects in language development, attention, uh, overall cognitive performance, uh, and uh, other behaviors as a result of uh, uh, prenatal uh, exposure to cannabis. Um, they quote some animal studies that show there's increasing evidence that uh, cause enduring neurobehavioral abnormalities in the exposed offspring. Um, as recent uh, as 2015, I found a study that uh, uh, found that uh, cannabis use uh, by pregnant mothers seemed to impair brain maturation in their children and predispose them to neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so these are uh, some of the studies that uh, are uh, referenced in the, uh, the position of the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, Two major studies uh, keep coming up, even though uh, now they're, uh, you know, pushing two decades old. Uh, but they did a pretty broad uh, uh, study of, of uh, uh, trying to examine the potential impact of prenatal cannabis exposure on uh, neurobehavioral and cognitive functioning, and uh, uh, their population base uh, really was. Uh, uh, noted to have a fairly, uh, as they define it, heavy consumption of uh, cannabis during pregnancy. Um, to name these, one was a maternal health practices and child development study. Um, these were primarily low socioeconomic status uh, patients who also reported use of alcohol and other drugs, but uh, 
the investigators uh, reported there was a strong association between daily use, and, and especially in the first and third trimesters, and uh, adverse uh, outcomes. Um, they measured uh, a lot of things like uh, verbal and reading scores, um, elements of depression, and uh, uh, unfortunately that uh, didn't really d differentiate cannabis exposure from uh, you know, other uh, pre- or postnatal environmental factors very well in that study. The uh, second uh, study that was a little large in population was the uh, Ottawa study called the Prenatal Prospective Study. And uh, uh, in opposition, this uh, looked at low-risk, white upper-class families in Canada. And uh, this study uh, seemed to show there was an association between uh, exposure and higher incidence of adolescent impulsivity, poor behavior, uh, what they call decreased executive function uh, at certain ages, uh, but then when they repeated studies at other ages, it was not uh, so consistent. So um, one thing they did not note that is often quoted that uh, uh, there was really no association between prenatal exposure and IQ scores. So another study in uh, 2005 uh, concluded that uh, if there was an association between prenatal cannabis exposure and certain uh, neurobehavioral and cognitive deficits, uh, it was a subtle one and primarily associated with very heavy exposure to cannabis as well as alcohol and tobacco. So um, it's uh, very difficult in these studies to really isolate out uh, potential uh, risk of cannabis when there are so many other uh, associated factors from socioeconomic status to use of alcohol uh, and uh, tobacco. Um, so you can understand, you know, there's concern, but uh, the uh, true cause and effect can be uh, very difficult to uh, assess and, uh, and all. So, um, just to mention as an aside, there was another study uh, about uh, risk of psychosis in children after maternal use of uh, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. And the conclusion of that study was that uh, uh, there certainly was an association with tobacco and uh, alcohol, but they could not demonstrate that association with cannabis. So after uh, looking at a number of these studies, uh, you know, finding uh, you know, a number of uh, criticisms of their methods and uh, uh, interpretations uh, and all, uh, as you can see, a lot of the studies looking at uh, fine points of neural functioning, uh, it can be you know, a real challenge to come up with uh, anything more than just a statistical association. Um, overall, you know, there's an estimate that uh, prenatal drug exposure, uh, and that includes uh, all the aforementioned alcohol, tobacco, uh, cannabis, and uh, other drugs, including methamphetamines, uh, cocaine, etc. cetera. Um, uh, overall, in these studies, that uh, this uh, difference in prenatal drug exposure accounts for perhaps 8% or less of the variance in children's scores on their developmental and cognitive tests. Um, so in all the studies, uh, consensus has been that cannabis contributes a whole lot less than alcohol and tobacco. Um, so when you kind of couple the, uh, the uh, uh, difference in these findings from study to study, um, you know, even some inconsistencies in the uh, same cohorts in these studies. Um, you know, it's uh, it's hard to make conclusions. So, um, it's really, uh, in, in a sense, you know, kind of amazing uh, to think that when you look at the uh, uh, significant uh, role that the endocannabinoid system plays in, in uh, uh, fetal development. Uh, that we can't demonstrate uh, 
uh, any more uh, association of uh, adverse outcomes than we do here. So, um, overall, you know, the question kind of comes down to, uh, you know, what uh, is your uh, risk tolerance and, uh, and all. Uh, when we uh, look at pregnancy and the use of medications or other drugs, uh, we uh, uh, pretty well rely on what they call categories of risk. And uh, just to outline those, uh, category A is uh, where a drug or medication has been studied and there are adequate, well-controlled studies that fail to demonstrate any risk to the fetus uh, with their use. Uh, category B is where they've had uh, animal studies that show no risk, but there have been no controlled human studies. Uh, so those are still considered probably uh, safe in uh, human pregnancy. Uh, category C, uh, which is where a lot of uh, medications fall, uh, is a category where animal reproduction studies show possible adverse effects on the fetus, uh, but there have also been no adequate or well-controlled studies done in humans but potential benefits of the use of that medication uh, may warrant the use of the drug in pregnant women despite the potential risks. And uh, when you look at uh, a lot of the uh, drugs that cannabis can substitute for, including uh, the opiates for pain, uh, some of the anti-emetic medications, uh, they all fall in the uh, category C. Uh, category D is where there is positive evidence of human fetal risk based on adverse reaction data, but potential benefits for an individual to use that drug may warrant use in pregnant women if it's felt to outweigh the risk to the fetus. Um, category X is where studies demonstrate fetal abnormalities and evidence of risk based on uh, data, but uh, uh, risks involve clearly uh, outweigh any potential benefit from use of those drugs. That's why it's under category X. So uh, when you start looking at the data that's out there about uh, cannabis use in, in pregnancy, I would have to say uh, at, uh, at worst, you know, it falls in the uh, category C uh, uh, area where you really want to look seriously at uh, why you would be uh, wanting to use it for treatment uh, during pregnancy and uh, be well aware of those risks. Um, conclusion really overall is that uh, uh, as with any drug, medication, diet, uh, in pregnancy you much prefer to be uh, totally safe as you can and uh, um, I think that uh, when I looked through the literature, a lot of it, uh, uh, you know, emphasized the, uh, the negatives and, uh, you know, it's a little hard to, to uh, criticize uh, uh, that, you know, when you want to do absolutely uh, the best you can. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, the uh, um, politics, as it were, uh, you know, I don't think that the uh, uh, so I say mindful use of cannabis for a symptomatic treatment uh, is uh, uh, going to raise uh, major risks uh, uh, for pregnancy. So again, uh, any individual who is uh, wanting to become pregnant or is pregnant, I uh, hope this has given you a little bit of information, uh, but I still hope that uh, if you're in that situation, you do take the time to really consult with your physician about use and uh, um, you know, we want to be uh, be uh, safe and mindful uh, in our use, and uh, um, you know, further our our uh, industry that way. So, just uh, seeing if we had any uh, questions popping up here. I uh, hope I've given you a little bit to think about here. This is uh, quite a big subject. Um, I've learned a lot uh, researching into it a little bit here, and uh, um, I think it's a, another area, particularly in our political climate. You know, politicians uh, 
always uh, looking hard at uh, you know protecting the public. Uh, certainly as a physician, uh, we still want to do no harm. We want to uh, be in the business of helping people. And uh, so this is uh, well, one area that uh, does, does pay a, deserve a lot of attention. So. All right, I uh, thank you. I want you all to have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you again in the next few weeks. Good night.